Okay, this is a backup video being posted to YouTube. I'm gonna go by slide by slide, just in case the videos I put on my PowerPoint do not work. Um, okay, so to begin, slide one. Modern Asian Literature, this is for class Lit 3833. I'm Jared Webster, um, and I'm titling the presentation I want to possess. Um, I'm gonna be comparing The Tattooer by Junishiro Tanazaki and Miss Sophia's Diary by Ding Ling. Moving on to slide two. Again, the texts are The Tattooer by Tanazaki Junishiro, the Japanese short story, and Japanese naturalism is what we're going to be kind of focusing on for Taz Tanazaki. And then for Miss Sophia's Diary, I'm going to be looking at the Chinese short story and the new culture movement. Um, so, yeah, moving on to slide number three. My key argument for this presentation is that both The Tattooer and Miss Sophia's Diary represent a transitional piece of literature for their respective nations as they examine love and power. Um, and, and that's pretty much all I'll say then. Um, I'm going to move on and I'm going to talk about the literary movements and periods. This is slide number four. Um, okay, so the Edo period, which is um, going to start with Japan first, and then um, the next slide will be focusing on the Chinese um, literary movements and periods. Um, a little bit of background for the Edo period, it's from 1603 to 1868. It presented literature that was dominated by romance and morality and remained very conservative in its conventions. Um, what I mean by that is that it's not um, really innovative in its form or what it's doing per se, it's just um, it's very conservative, it usually will have a male protagonist, um, the love interests potentially aren't even named, um, and it deals not necessarily with the deeply personal, but represented the social contract of romance and the societal values attributed to morality, but not necessarily a protagonist um, who has a moral dilemma um, intrinsically unresolved due to his dark desires. For instance, he's not um, somebody who um, is, uh, he's not a polygamist, for instance, um, and he's battling with his morality as a polygamist in a society that maybe doesn't appreciate polygamy. Uh, that's just like an example of what it wouldn't be during the Edo period. Um, it's more so in the morality of the idea that this is a clearly laid out to be right and this is clearly laid out to be wrong. Um, and it's talking about those kind of social contracts within characters that are are more so for instructional teaching um, as literature pieces rather than an exploration of um, what is really right and what is really wrong within the inner self. Moving on, while the Tattooer is set in the Edo period, it was published during the Meiji period, but seems to stand as a transitional piece of literature from Meiji to the Taisho era. The Meiji period saw the rise of Japanese naturalism inspired by Emile Zola, who is a French philosopher and author. Um, Japanese naturalism focused on the depiction of writers, characters, inner reality. Um, this is to say their inner workings of their mind and the perspective that they had or carried. Um, not the third person, John went to the store, John found a girl, and John fell in love. Um, more so, John was thinking about how lonely he was, and John was really wanting to, to find love and to be inspired by a woman. And just so happened to be miraculously that when he went to the store, he found the woman of his dreams. And it's, it's something a little bit more, um, a little bit more personal, and looking at the inner reality of his life in terms of society or in terms of the individual alone. Um... So there we have, that is to say, the honest perspective of a certain individual, which would be seen as private. Although the Meiji period did not delve further into the inner reality, it created a rather shallow perspective, giving birth to the I novel. Um, for instance, I went to the store, and I found a girl, and I fell in love. Um, this was something that was a little bit innovative in form compared to the Edo period, was the idea of using the pronoun I to represent um, a first-person narrative. Then in the Taisho area, from 1912 to 26, um, they were interested in the political and focused on Western thought, borrowing ideas of about convention and prose from Western writers during the height of the modernism period. This led to a progressive prose style, which includes some modernist qualities that the te contemporary world today can still see the influences thereof. Um, in this sense, I'm just going to use Ezra Pound because I'm a fan. Um, he was an expatriate American who moved to Europe, so he brought American ideals with him to Europe, which is still a Western civilization, um, and mingled his ideas of America and the things that he learned there, as well as the ideas that he was learning and gathering from the Western thought that was occurring in Europe. This guy, Ezra Pound, also published in Japan during the 1910s and 1920s, so he was in direct connection with Japanese literary figures um, today. He was publishing works in magazines and little magazines and in articles and newspapers 
um, as a correspondent for some of the magazines that were being published in America and in Europe. Um, so that being said, that is a, a just one um, narrow but very clear example of the transatlanticism modernism that is taking place during this era of the Tasho era. Um, and, and this is where the Western thought comes in. This is where borrowing ideas from Western writers and, and that being the focus of, of Eastern um, literature at the time is because of this transatlanticism, which was occurring um, during modernism as different cultures and nations were coming to the same ideas about what art could be and what was art. Um, so moving on from there, the tattoo represents this transition piece because it derives from Japanese naturalism, um, but also experiments with some elements that could be categorized as modernist, i.e. the magical realism of the, t of the spider tattoo towards the end of the story, or the exposition's unique identification of the setting. Um, he doesn't narrate specifically like, it was the year, so-and-so, but he says it was an age of, of beauty, it was an age of nobility, um, which is something that is a little bit different um, than a traditional setting would be um, prescribed in an exposition. And then another modernist um, quality that's not listed on my PowerPoint, but is the idea of this self-reflexiveness. Um, so he is a Sakichi in the tattooer, is, is a master tattooer, um, and he has this self-reflexivity as he ruminates on not only just his inner workings, you know, Tanazaki reveals these things, but he also reveals his deep and dark um, desires and pleasures, which is, I think, a step above what the I novel was, was starting to do in the Meiji period. Um, and keep in mind also that the tattooer is set in the Edo period and was published in the Meiji period, which is another reason why it kind of represents this transitional piece, because he has a lot of Taisho elements, a lot of this like Western thought and um, this modernist aspect to it. Um, and that's it for slide number four. We're going to go ahead and move on to slide number five. So here we're going to focus on Chinese literary movements and periods, um, starting just right off the bat with the New Culture Movement from 1917 to 1923. In China, um, a literary revolution resulting in more experimentation with forms and styles of literature. There was a rise of literature written um, in Chinese vernacular rather than traditional Chinese characters, which began to be established in this movement um, there was also a stronger focus on Western thought, which led to innovations and narratives. The same things that were happening in Japan were happening in China, but in different ways. Um, They're still being influenced by Western thought because of transatlanticism in terms of the modernist era, and their forms and their literature were being experimented um, with just because they were, they were growing as, as artists and as literary intellectuals. Um, within the new culture movement is another movement, a sub-movement, um, called the May 4th Movement, um, which was in direct response to the student protests in Beijing over China's weak negotiations on May 4th, um, 1919, and the Treaty of Versailles, which ended World War I. This movement specifically shows the increase of politicized texts in modern Chinese literature, which previously was engaged in the Mandarin Duck and Butterfly genre. The Mandarin Ducks and Butterfly genre focused on conservative romanticism and was made purely for entertainment not social or political change. So here we have um, a transition from the conventions of conservative romance and the ideas of entertainment, and that was the purpose, the sole purpose for literature, rather than um, to enact or to influence um, society and politics. And this was what the, the May 4th movement was really about, was bringing about propaganda and, and trying to influence the, the politicians in the area and the society and, and start to break and change these rules um, that were either oppressive or were limiting for the Chinese culture at the time. Um, along with being highly politicized, the May 4th movement produced texts that were intimately personal, adapting innovative forms. For instance, Miss Sophia's diary is in the narrative form of a diary entry. So there are several diary entries, um, and that wasn't something that was very common or popular in the time. Um, that's just a, an example of an innovative form in terms of the narrative style. We're, we're moving away from this third person omniscience and, and starting to delve into what the first person can explain um, and still how the first person can interact socially and, and what kind of change they can bring about socially from their unique perspective of a first person narrative. Um, so in this context, both Japan and China had a similar transition um, from conservative literature and conventions and in content to different individual movements that were all focused on Western thought and experimentation. Both nations also experienced an increased interest of the highly personal and the political ability of literature. By political ability, I mean the ability that 
literature has to enact change or to influence um, other people socially and politically. Um, and that is it for slide number five. We're going to go ahead and move on to slide number six, naturally. So here I'm just going to summarize really quick the texts. Um, I'm not going to read verbatim from the slide because I think I give a really good summary and there's no read reason for me to read what's on the slide verbatim all the time. So that tattooer is about a master tattooer who has a dark desire and a dark pleasure to give pain to people um, as he tattoos them in a traditional Japanese style. That sexually arouses him and sexually pleases him. Um, there's also a darker desire that he has to eventually create this um, imagined masterpiece on the skin of a beautiful woman. So there's a lot of eroticism in the tattoo and a lot of um, this exploration of the kink and the taboo um, in that story, as well as the personal inner workings and the inner ruminations and revelations of a character, Sakichi, as it's written in the third person omniscience, not in the I novel style or in the first person narrative. Then we have Miss Sophia's Diary, which is by Ding Ling. Um, the other one is by uh, Junichiro Tanizaki. Um, and Ding Ling, Ding Ling's Miss Sophia's Diary um, has Sophia, who has tuberculosis, at the very beginning has a prognosis for hysteria by a doctor, um, which is this, you know, massively wrong um, doing of scientists in, in medicine previously in generations before us, um, where essentially if a woman was um, disobedient or ungoverned um, or had too much emotion within herself, she was then claimed to be a hysterical, um, which was essentially that like they weren't being or filling the role, the gender role that had been associated for them. Um, and so therefore they were told to eat and sleep a lot and not to read, think, or do very much at all. Um, the right from the very beginning we have this characterization that she has this prognosis, but in fact decides to go against it in the rebellion and um, reads everything that she can get her hands on. That's just like in the first few pages. Um, the story about Miss Sophia's diary as she's telling these journal entries and interacting with her friends um, as she's she's going through uh, like a healing process because she has tuberculosis, she's kind of in and out of hospitals um, through the journal entries a little bit. Um, she's got this this friend who is completely in love with her, but she has no want or desire for him. His name is Whitey, at least that's how I pronounce it. Um, and Whitey loves her, but it, it's completely unrequited. Um, she, in fact, takes advantage of that and manipulates him and uses him um, because she has her eyes set on Jing Lishi, who is this stunning man from, I believe, Singapore, if I'm not mistaken. And he's a new student in town, and he um, is her new object. Her, she wants to possess him. Um, it says very explicitly in the text in this idea of this lust and this possessing. She likes to play this game. It's a, it's a, it's a game that isn't very overtly stated within the text, but I believe that it is very clearly um, represented in Sophia's journal entries, mm -hmm. that she likes to be seducing and to tantalize and to tease, but she doesn't um, want to give in or show that she's interested in a man. Um, she wants the man to be crawling after her mm -hmm. um, and to be completely be bothered by her and, and want her more than anything else in the world, but it's a game that she has to play very subtly and very um, cleverly and she's looking for an opponent that can compete with her. Um, eventually she does win um, Jing Li Shi in the end, but to no avail because of how manipulative she is and how obsessed she is with playing this game. Um, they never actually give in to any affair or, or carnal lust or, or satisfaction. Um, and that ends up being ruined in and of itself. Sophia at the very end, uninterested in going to the Western Hills with her friends and staying in Beijing, which she's been for quite some time. She takes a train south, hoping, I think, for the promise of love, but mostly for this excessive thing that she cannot help but play the game of of not necessarily playing hard to get, because it's much more complicated than that, but the idea of, of seducing other people, and she wants a component that's at her intellectual and emotional capacity. I'm going to move on to slide number seven, where we talk about my take on the text more rhetorically. Here we're going to talk about the secret desire in the tattooer. We're on page two, Tanazaki doesn't waste time, and he explicitly says, Deep in his heart, the young tattooer concealed a secret pleasure and a secret desire. Naming um, the secret pleasure and the secret desire develops something a little bit more rhetorical within this text as he's 
um, specifically ruminating on the idea of this inner working or this inner reality um, that is within Japanese naturalism, you know. It's this, this purpose to, to explore those things, but he's taking it a step further again to look at the deep pleasure or the deep um, secret desire, the things that are not necessarily just private, but completely secret and unknown, sometimes to the individual himself. For a long time, Sakichi had cherished the desire to create a masterpiece on the skin of a beautiful woman, um, and that is the naming of the secret desire, um, his future desire, his goal. Um, when his secret pleasure, as I mentioned, was the pain um, that he gives to other people sexually arouses him as he's tattooing them. Um, then I have two other quotes. Your own feelings are revealed here, and then this painting shows your future. At the Kind of towards the end of the story, Sakichi shows two paintings to, um, sorry, to the girl. I couldn't think of the name because she's unnamed in the text. Um, so Sakichi shows these two paintings to the girl, and the first one he says, your own feelings are revealed here, and I think that this is, again, um, Tanazaki directly ruminating on the idea of revealing these inner realities and these personal deeper secrets that we have as human nature, um, as well as these secret desires with this painting shows your future. Um, so it has this reflective kind of mirroring of naming the secret desire and secret pleasure of Sakichi, and then Sakichi himself names and shows, reveals um, the feelings and the future of the woman who he eventually tattoos. Um, then I've got a rhetorical um, analysis here with Tom Suzuki observes that the new notion of the Shosetsu novel as the ultimate means of revealing the truth, Shinri of life, and the universe through the realistic representation Moshe of human feelings or human nature, Ninjo, um, spread rapidly among Meiji intellectuals. And this is by Song, and Song is quoting Suzuki here. Um, I think that this is really important as we look at the idea of this, as Tanazaki is revealing these secrets um, and these inner realities, these mental inner workings, which is very modernist quality, is also a, a quality of the Meiji intellectuals, um, as it says here. Um, remember that the tattooer is set in the Edo period, but it was published in 1910, 1911, um, which is during the Meiji period. Um, and the Tasho era elements that we get are these modernist qualities that includes, like the delving deeper into the um, inner workings and inner mind of, of an individual. And then we're going to move on talk about that a little bit more on slide eight now. We have the tattooer again, Secret Desire. I have two more quotes from the text and then I have two rhetorical quotes for this slide. To make you truly beautiful, I have poured my soul into this tattoo. Today there is no woman in Japan to compare with you. Your old fears are gone. All men will be your victims. Now this is after the tattooing has already been done, after he's abducted, sedated, um, and then non-consensually tattooed this, this woman. He makes this proclamation that she is now the most beautiful woman in the world and that no one could ever compare and that um, she can rule men forever because of the beauty that she now has. Afterwards, he states that there is still some pain that needs to be doing because of the bath that comes after a tattoo to let the color soak in. Um, in response to that, the unnamed girl says, I can bear anything for the sake of beauty. Despite the pain that was coursing through her body, she smiled. Um, and I think that this is kind of in this dialogue and discourse of the secret desire and secret pleasure, these things that she secretly likes and secretly wants, is this the sake of beauty she's willing to have pain and she smiles i think maybe a bit both of the idea of the pain and as also the idea of the reward of this beauty now this all ties into my rhetorical quotes the first one coming from joshua mostow which is naturalism was very much a male genre in japan the shisho setsu came to be considered the benchmark of pure literature the important part here is the male genre this is a text written by a male author with a unnamed female character who is only 15. Um, she's only 10 years when she's first sexually objectified, then 15, 16 years old when she gets abducted, sedated, unconsensually tattooed, and then um, is then afterwards proclaimed to be the most beautiful girl in the world by this by this man, this master tattooer. And she is pretty much okay with it, where she says, I can bear anything for the sake of beauty. Um, these are things that are very much so coming from a male perspective and from a male author. And I think that it's very important that we look at Japanese naturalism specifically as a male genre. It has this confessional aspect and this 
um, this deeply personal aspect in the sense that it's revealing his or the masculine deeper darker desires not so much um, a female perspective or uh, authorship um, my second quote is that Japanese naturalism was found out of the awkward combination of the pursuit of modern self and naturalism the modern self comes in with this self-awareness and this reflectiveness that Ta Tanazaki produces within Sakichi, knowing his pleasure and knowing his desire, and then revealing to the unnamed girl her feelings and her future. I think that that has a very modernist quality to it in, in terms of the modern self and the self-reflexivity um, within the text itself as it's talking about textual analysis, right? Um... Okay, and that is that is all on my take for the tattooer. This next slide is going to be on Miss Sophia's diary. Okay, so Miss Sophia's diary, to possess, to lust. I'm going to go through this a little bit quickly because now my video is running past 20 minutes. The quotes that I have on the left side represent um, what I have being written on the right side. I have Miss Sophia's diary was a groundbreaking tale that talked about women's suffering, sexuality, and difficulty through the use of diary entries. For instance, um, we have one quote that says, now the universe seems full of love. This is relatively after the fact that um, Sophia has successfully captured, so to speak, um, Jing Li Shi in this seductive game that she plays. This next quote is, I want to possess him, it's explicitly stated um, and explicitly made in this journal entry that she is aware of her manipulation, she is aware of the game and the seductiveness of nature of what she wants. Um, and it, that is to possess him, to capture him, to own him, um, so that he would love her. But not to follow through with anything, because it's, it's, all, it's all part of this, this game um, that she can't help playing. She then says, I won't believe love is so logical and scientific. And I think that this is part of the, the modernist quality that um, Ding Ling interprets or implements here, is the universal truths that we sprinkle through um, literature as authors. And this is one of them where love is, I won't believe love is so logical and scientific. And I think that this is um, kind of in direct relation to Sophia's inner workings and inner mind. Um, keep in mind as I talk about this, that this is for Chinese literature and focusing more so on the May 4th movement. Um, now, it's not a political text as much as it is a social text. Um, so on page 54, in the last paragraph of the December entry, don't love a woman so undeserving of your affection as I am. This is important because she has low self-esteem. She's aware of her manipulated um, qualities. She's aware that she tortures Whitey. She's aware that um, her desire um, to possess Jing Li Shi is wrong, but she cannot help herself. And this is where it's groundbreaking tale for a woman suffering sexuality and difficulty. Um, these are things that she's experiencing. And the groundbreaking part, real quick, is, is, a, is a very easy, quick list, is that this is a female author writing in a time where she's not supposed to be talking about eroticism or lost her power, writing in journal entries, which becomes this confessional tone, also writing from a female protagonist's point of view in the first-person narrative, explaining her sexuality and her lust and her um, desires, which aren't um, traditionally accepted or traditionally um, you know, published for for most um, authors during this time. Most of it is going to be a male writer talking about the male perspective and his relationship with society. This one is completely opposite, where it's talking it's a female writer talking about the female relationship that she has with society in terms of her friends and her lovers, both unrequited and unwanted. Excuse me. Moving on to slide number ten. Um. Okay, I've got three quotes on the left side. We've, You've been in love with me for such a long time, Whitey, has he captured me? This word here, captured me, is, I think, really important when we think about this idea of the game and the possession um, that she requires and desires of Jing Li Shi. Um, and it corresponds with, I've always wanted a man who would really understand me. If he doesn't understand me and my needs, then what good are love and empathy? Um, this is directly in relation to, to Whitey, who she, she doesn't love, um, because he's not at that intellectual or emotional capacity. Um, and this is, again, part of that um, modernist quality here where we have, if he doesn't understand me and my needs, then what good are love and empathy? And this is coming from the perspective of a woman from a female author during the modernist era with, with these new ideas in 1927. Um, these are things that traditionally you wouldn't write about from a female perspective. 
Um, traditionally, a female perspective would be honored for any male to, to find her. And a traditional female perspective would be honored for, for anything to come of love and to, to get married as soon as possible. She's got a quarter who she she's not interested in whatsoever and refuses to fall in love with. Um, and is regarding Jing Lishi, this new man from Simpor, as, as better. Um, although not intellectually and emotionally capacity doesn't have the same intellectual and emotional capacity as her. Um, and again, with that groundbreaking tale reference, we've got this quote from the introduction, which is, Older Chinese literary convention had discouraged women from writing on erotic topics. It just it wasn't part of conservative Chinese literature. So again, another example of how it's a groundbreaking text with new innovative forms, um, which stem from the new culture movement and the political and social contracts that she challenges in the text are, again, an example of the May 4th movement. Here's my, my another rhetorical analysis quote where I've got, whereas Western naturalism c captures others and the individual in relation to society, Japanese naturalism usually describes a writer's private life in a space that is unconnected to society. This practice comes from this work by Katai Futan and is regarded as prototypical shisosetsu. And this is Song quoting Fowler. This is a really important quote because it creates a dichotomy that I think is important to talk about. Um, the Japanese naturalism focuses on the private self in a space that is separate from society. When we read the tattooer, we do not worry about Sakichi's abduction of the girl. We do not worry about Sakichi's um, social contract with other people or how he, he tattooed her without consent and, and all these other things. I mean, as readers, generally, yeah, we worry about them. But Sakichi himself or the narrator um, that, is, that is telling Sakichi's tale doesn't talk about that at all, but works directly with the private, isolated events in, that are happening within Sikichi's inner reality. Western naturalism focuses on the individual and society and that direct relationship, which I think is very evident in Miss Sophia's diary. And this is how um, Ding Ling is using Western thought and borrowing Western thought, aside from her sacking Madame Vaubery, which has been stated in some of these other PowerPoints. She's taking this Western naturalism which is sometimes also like Chinese realism in the sense that she's objectively showing how a character like Sophia, who is um, manipulative, self has low self-esteem, um, loves to play this tantalizing and teasing game with men, um, and, and has these deep desires and darker desires, even so, to possess them and to want them to want her. Um, how that relates to society, how her relationship with her friends and those social contracts um, kind of bend and break in some cases. Um, specifically because of the actions that she has and the, the roles that she takes as a friend and as a as a seducer and as a lover. Um, and now I'm going to move on because I think that's pretty much all I have to say about that. Um, this next slide is my mapping slide. I'm not going to go through this slide because I don't have time to, but um, there, there are very brief explanations of the important events or locations that happen within the text and a couple one or two icons about um, the author themselves. Finally, I've got three last critical viewpoints. One is from Ken Whalen. He says, The great social and cultural change not only saw the widespread use of the vernacular, but also the experimentation of literary forms borrowed from the West. Um, this is in specific relation to um, Miss Sophia's diary, which I think I just talked about and a couple slides ago with the idea of the vernacular being used. This is in very, very kind of like easy and formal use, especially in the terms of the diary entry. You know, this their vernacular is how you talk to yourself and how you think and write. This is a new and innovative idea in Chinese literature at the time. Um, and this is something that Ding Ling implemented in Miss Sophia's diary. Moving on to the second quote, I have the essential element of modernity in modern literature is the awakening of the modern self. This is super crucial. The awakening of the modern self happens in the girl and in Sakichi and the tattooer. How it happens is first, namely, Sakichi is aware of his deep pleasure and, and his deep secret, and then he also names them. He also reveals to the girl her own feelings and her future through those two paintings. And I think that this is part of that self-awakening um, of the modern self, which is obviously this modern um, and modernist quality that exists within on the tattooer, which makes it a transitional piece from this Meiji period to the Tasho area, which focused more on modernism. And then in um, Miss Sophia's diary, we have the awareness of the self, 
Sophia is a very self-aware person with her low self-esteem, her manipulative actions, and her journal entries. Um, she isn't sitting here wondering why she is the way that she is. She knows that she is um, and how she acts and how she behaves. She understands right and wrong. Um, she's very self-aware with her actions. And I think that there's an awakening of the modern self there with her self-reflective diary entries, especially at the end where she decides to not go to Beijing or not say to Beijing and, and not to go to the Western Hills, but to take a train south somewhere with a promise of, of hope and love. Um, she actually specifically references in the text, oh, how pathetic you are. Um, aware of herself and her situation and her desire to, to manipulate people and to play this game of love, but still unable to break away from the things that she she deeply desires to possess people. My last quote, um, and this is pretty much where I'll end, is from Joshua Mustow again. Naturalists believe that they served society by giving the unvarnished truth and because their own thoughts and lives were the only area where they could be sure of having access to truth. So we didn't really talk about this a lot with the tattooer, but the, the idea of Japanese naturalism is that writers trusted the truth that they knew objectively within their own life, and that was something that they brought onto literature and put onto the page. Um, this is something that is seen a little bit in the tattooer, although Tanazaki isn't a master tattooer. Um, the sexual nature of the tattooer and the eroticism that exists and the desires that are, that are labeled are things that he's aware of as human nature, of things that he has observed as an author and as a writer. And that's part of the rumination of how he um, develops the text and how he reveals these inner realities that we, that we have. And that is it. That is my 31 minute lecture as I go through the PowerPoint. Thank you so much for, for having the time to listen through all of this. Um, and I hope that this video is helpful. Um, and I hope that you were able to follow along okay in the PowerPoint. Um, thank you so much again. I really hope that you have a great rest of your day. Um, thank you guys. Bye.